Hello and welcome. As we draw an end and we draw the curtains to the year 2020, we here at the Bola Bola Show would like to go through some of the things that have happened the past 10 years, you know, that, that has affected us in one way or another. Of course, you know, we need not be reminded more of the pandemic that struck this year, where everyone were told to sit down at home, were asked to sit down at home and wear masks when they go out. You know, no one saw that coming. Of course, also, you know, if you're from the UK, you know, nobody saw the UK Brexit refer referendum coming, you know, and, and UK deciding to leave the EU. We also learned that the country can go bankrupt in Greece, and that happened over this decade as well. Of course, we, we all experienced the Donald Trump presidency and that memorable handshake between Donald Trump and Supreme Leader Kim from North Korea. As Malaysians, you know, it was the return of Tun M as a Prime Minister, being the oldest world leader in the world, a world record indeed. There, there were also incidences where, you know, it, it affected many people, like the disappearance of the MH370 and the gunning down of the MH17, you know, Things like this really affected a lot of people and our thoughts and prayers are with the families of those involved there. As we look at sporting events, you know, the 2019 Masters victory by Tiger Woods was definitely a source of inspiration for many of us to actually see Tiger make a comeback. You know, there were many Tiger Woods fans out there that actually shed tears when he actually nailed that final part and won that Masters when that green jacket was put on his shoulders. It, it was a belief that, you know, anything is possible and if you keep trying at it, you know, you can make it happen. Of course, also throughout this decade, you know, there were moments of victories, moments of sadness. You know, we would like to pay tribute to some of the sportsmen that have passed on during this decade, you know. People like Kobe Bryant, Paulo Rossi this year. Alejandro Sabela and Gerard Julia, news that came in just recently, and of course, Diego Maradona as well. And who would forget Papa Buba Diop, you know, that iconic celebration that he left, well, that he left us in 2002, scoring that goal for Senegal against France. You know, again, these guys, they, they, they have left a mark in all our lives, you know and our thoughts are with them as well and their families. In moments of triumph, you know, Spain, being a perennial underachiever, finally nailing their first World Cup in 2010, followed that with the 2012 Euro as well. For Malaysian fans, you know, follow the English Premier League, you know. We have seen lots of things happen the past decade as well. As an MU fan, you know, it was the end of an era for Sir Alex Ferguson. And that was also our last title in 2013. I hope more to come. Our rivals, Man City, got their first title after a long time. In 2012, of course, that memorable Aguero goal. Liverpool, after waiting 30 years, got finally got their title as well under Jurgen Klopp. Another inspiration, if you need another one, look at Leicester City, you know, triumphing in 2015-2016 season. That's a story right there. And of course, as we move into Malaysian football, it was the dominance of JDT, you know. Since 2014, they've won every single Malaysian League title out there and continue to be a force to be reckoned with. And as we move into local football, also the 2010 is a year where Malaysia won the AFF Suzuki Cup and why this victory stands so great and people still talk about it till today. Why people still remember it, the 2010 victory for Malaysia in the AFF Suzuki Cup. And this is where today we at the Bola Bola Show would like to walk down memory lane, lift back that no nostalgic event again. So listeners out there, thank you for staying on with us. Thank you for subscribing to us and thank you for supporting us. And we here at the Bola Bola Show would like to wish all of you a very Merry Christmas and let's look forward to the year 2021 for more good things to come. Thank you guys and enjoy the show. Oh, what a goal it is! 
So there you have it, folks. On this episode, it's all about looking back at 10 years and uh, the 10-year anniversary of the 2010 AFF Suzuki Cup. And as you know, this was uh, considered uh, Malaysia's last great success, uh, especially when it comes to the senior men's team. And uh, of course, guys, you know, in our lifetime, we haven't been uh, privileged enough to see Malaysia uh, winning things on international stage, right? Yeah, we, I mean, we, we, we really had to wait a long time for, for something like this to happen. Lah, you right. know, and... Uh, I think the last they won was a murder car tournament, I think, in, in 1990s, 1990s, I think. I mean, I, would, I, I mean, for me, murder car tournament is just an invitational tournament. Ah, uh, correct. Uh, uh, I mean, if I were to think, for me, I think the last could be the 1989 SEA Games. Yeah, uh, mm, yes. mm, yeah. that SEA Games with Lim, Lim Tiong Kim and all those exactly. guys. Exactly, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. The Lim, Tiong, <laughs> Lim Tiong Kim was there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sherberger Singh also as well, right? Sherberger yeah. Singh was there, yeah. Uh, okay, yeah. Okay. Uh, but 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 of course you know if somebody asked me about that time I I can't really hardly remember much about it I I do know that we were given a public holiday for that success lah that I was aware I think it was ten mm-hmm. three that time yes you know government announced a public holiday because we won the Sea Games gold medal but up after that I guess you know it's always been uh, one painstaking journey I, I remember we lost the Philippines we lost the Philippines. Vietnam and then, uh, the, and then yeah. the Cairo last month moment with Laos exactly. <laughs> I mean, you just, know, that was, just maybe you know, all the, the tragedies yeah. that happened like, in the Sea Games yeah, yeah. 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 and then of course uh, of course I, we can always remember the first EFF Suzuki Cup which we went to the final yeah. uh, the we lost to Thailand one year yeah. okay. yeah. so Sambal Amara was the uh, I think was the some kind of a Madonna of Malaysia at that time Yeah, yeah, he was. Yeah. I think a, a couple of men of the match. Yes, yes. Yeah, I think I remember Samsudin Abdul Rahman. I think in the semi-final against yes. a flying mm-hmm. header. What? Yes, yes, yes. But looking at this squad, I mean, guys, you know, we we do know that this was Raja Gopal's boys. Yeah. Okay, King Raja boys, basically. You know, because they were a very young team. There's only a barely, uh, only a handful of players who were considered senior. Fourteen members of the squad was actually below 23. I mean, I mean, do you think it was a very Bold decision from him to depend on this group of boys. Actually, going into going into this tournament, if you if you look at it, um, he had that that trust factor lah with his boys already, right? Since the the Sea Games winning team, and if you look back at the squad, uh, the highest cap player is Safi Sali. You know, and he's going in there with 20 caps only at, at that time, lah. You know, in the in the tournament, and, and basically the rest of them senior caps are. Then there's nobody above going. I mean, going above 20 caps, you see. So, uh, it's a relatively very young squad, and all those guys are in their early 20s. You know, like what you say, most 14 guys from the C game squad, right? They under 23, under 23 squad. So this was definitely a moment where these guys. I mean. Now, of course, they are all household names, lah. You know, guys like Sapi Graim, you know, Eskunalan, Mahal, Mahali Jasuli, uh, of course, uh, Kairul Pamiche, Mat Ape, Mat Yo as well. So, so they have become familiar names now. But back then, guys, when 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 during this AFF Cup, people are still getting to know these guys, you know, on the whole and being a very young squad. So I think Raja really put his trust on these guys, lah. I mean, also, but yeah. also looking at the Raja Gopal because I think uh, one of the thing he does is, I think he took fresh approach because usually when a, when a national team take over, right? They either they they take over the previous uh, management or previous coach team, mm-hmm. perhaps or maybe one to two players they mix from the junior squad and make them to play. But I think what he did was, he he had a vision whereby he going to create this team with four years, five years men. So that's the reason why he took the under 23 squad. So they can gel with the team, and then to to have a kind of vision whereby you know, to basically they start to have an exposure within them for four five years because right after they took over the first match uh, in the under 26 squad, they beat Zimbabwe 4-0. Mm-hmm. But less, I'm not sure what the quality of Zimbabwe in that time. But it was for a, you know for a young team to meet Zimbabwe in a in a A class international friendly is not a joke. Mm-hmm. And so I think the strategy Raja Gopal did was very smart, and I think it paid him off towards the uh, in fact end of his career. So he never opted for the what what he called that the proven winner sort of thing. He just took it a bold step. Okay, I'm going to merge his team, with young team, and let's mold together with them and see how far they grow. And he did well, did well actually. Mm. But, but, but but it was a risk, lah, right? Also to 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 take take this sort of path because. Um, I mean, we all know. I mean, as, as we go deeper later in this edition, we'll know what happened in the first game. But it, I mean, 
imagine you going into this tournament with this kind of squad and then starting off in that way i mean uh, it, it was really something i think raja really had that he was a good motivator lah. i i i i i suppose lah, to really bring out the best like the boys but yeah. then look at lin tiong kim i think the last lin tiong kim had a podcast with him he told us young boys or the players lack of exposure so i think they just bang with it i think he had a strategy i think they also had a few high profile friendly matches from mistake uh, manchester united and uh, few of teams so i think they had a strategy but and it worked so the risk was uh, calculated risk rather than uh, he blindly yeah. went for him i think kudos for him for thinking such a way and uh, doing the and, best for the national team and, if you ask me and and the thing is when i look at the squad you know looking back now i realize there's some glaring names that are missing like indra yes. putra indra mm. putra probably back then was at his peak of his career uh, mm-hmm. even hyrodin omar for that matter i mean these two are household names these two names at the back of our hand we can we know who these players are and yep. they were not even part of that squad so it's a very risky like what bala said like it's a calculative uh, risk like uh, coach raja gopal told and well you know as we get into this episode of course we will talk more about you know what happened in each and every game uh, but first well we want to you know we got a couple few guests in our show so you know let's uh, listen from their perspective exactly about the background of this team going into the 2010 AFF Suzuki Cup. First up, we got Malaysian football supporter and a prominent voice for the grassroots and community football scene in this country, Carl from Parang Bola Sepak. All right, I think uh, I think around that time I was uh, 17, 18 years old. Uh, so obviously, as someone who just finished SPM and all, uh, optimism were, was quite quite up. Uh, you know, we just leaving school up as more to in mm. relations, yeah, in relations to that. You know, you you're very ho- hopeful for a lot of things, and also in the previous year, uh, the Tegera Jogopal led uh, the Harimau, uh, the under 23s to see game success. So you could see that you know there was a bit of a hunger, but at the same time, when you look at the uh, friendlies that happened, the, the international friendlies that happened, uh, the results weren't that uh, good. But yep. you could see the way to that togetherness of the team. And you could see that you know uh, the squad selection that he listed out uh, were, were were fair in in my opinion were fair. And if you look at the list of the names, they were serial winners. You know, uh, they have won things that year, in particular, mm-hmm. and they have played together, uh, in particular as well. So again, expectation wise, you know, anything can happen in 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 cup football uh, in uh, regional cup football. Yep. So at the same time, you know, you're playing away in Indonesia. You know, you know you you. Optimism, 100%. percent. Then you slowly factoring all the other components, and then it dips down a little bit. But we have to remember, football is being played on the pitch. Uh, all the external factors, in motor will will come into play. But it's all about the starting the starting level and the rest of the squad, you know, responsibilities lah. Uh, mm. See how they uh, they they try to achieve things lah. But you know. Um, The really interesting thing about what Coach Azigopal picked uh, back then is because those players weren't necessarily were in their prime yet. They were on the verge of heading, of climbing towards their prime. You know, like Safi Sali, Shafiq Rahim, uh, Nusharul Ilan. Uh, around that time, if, if I'm not mistaken, Nusharul hasn't won anything yet. Um, apa, uh, lo, uh, domestically. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it, again, uh, correct me if I'm wrong lah. But... You know, if you see the rest of the squad, you know, and then they are there, you can see the motivation for hunger for cups up to Mutu. Because I do remember that, you know, when you have won something, uh, again, this is just basing on certain observations and certain experiences, uh, yeah. certain experiences, and you kind of like when you have won things, you kind of go a bit on the complacent mode. Uh, so mm. it takes a very good coach to like uh, keep them on track. Uh, yes, so they, most of them already won the SEA Games uh, prior. But it's I think it's really good that uh, the management team uh, that led us to the 2010 AFF Suzuki Cup win, uh, you know, kept them highly motivated despite you know uh, the first game. You know, we lost five one despite scoring the first goal. Uh, kept 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 it going lah. Kept it going. Yeah. So relatively, you find this is a very hungry team lah. Hmm. Yeah. 
you know, compared uh, to a team base with you know a lot of old guys with experience, hunger. You 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 really feel like hunger really overcomes that experience part. Hmm. And also, uh, they had the quality to back it up, lah. Uh, mm. And also, you when you look at uh, Coach Jago Pals uh, and took Coach Sanjeev from the rest of the coaching staff, right? They took the boys uh, since uh, if I'm mistaken, uh, 2006 when they were still young, relatively mm. young. Mm-hmm. So the expression saya kenal pemain saya is is not a lie. You know, they that that, that coaching staff knew what that batch could could do. Uh, it's all uh, down to their discipline. Uh, their discipline, their, their ethics, and uh, you know how they keep on practice and practice and practice. Uh, I know, I know this sounds a bit of a plug, but recently there was this uh, show on Apple TV uh, called Ted Lasso. Uh, there was one particularly good scene where mm-hmm. you know when when you're practicing and when you're on training is between the team is where they can have control, uh, and when they have uh, when they're facing the other the other team, uh, it's it's against uh, the the other team like that. Yeah, I'm trying to get here is that when they are in control of the preparation, suppose they move to, it's really interesting uh, how effective those preparations were. And I remember re- listening to uh, quite a number of podcasts, uh, interviewing uh, the women's, uh, the United States women's uh, head coach, as mm-hmm. well as many other head coaches around the world. Uh, preparation is key, so you could see that. Uh, Preparations uh, were 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 great uh, going going uh, uh, going throughout the tournament. Yes, uh, I said earlier that the friendlies weren't ideal up to too, but you know as you see the games gone by, they have reflected the mistakes that has made. They they cost corrected, and you know uh, slowly does it, and uh, they take game they they, could, they they took it game by game, and uh, it led them to the promised land lah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Next up, an Indonesian football enthusiast who has written a couple of books on the related subject, who is more famously known in Twitter as Jakarta Casual, Anthony Sutton. I'm not just saying this because I'm talking to a group of Malaysian guys here, but actually maybe going into really, really some of my old posts on Jakarta Casual blog, um, I was leaning more towards Malaysia because of things that had been developing maybe over the previous two or three years. And I was thinking that maybe this could be a, a year that Malaysia can have a good impression on the Super Cup. Um, within Indonesia, of course, it's, you know, Indonesia's Indonesia and the chairman of the peer society says, oh, we're going to win it. You know, you've got to win it without actually doing anything about preparing for it. But um, there was some excitement, I think, in Indonesia because they were actually taking on board at, um, naturalized players. And so, for example, Christian Gonzalez, who had been a top scorer, a prolific scorer in Indonesia for many, many years, he was being given his chance in the national team, as was a younger talent called Irfan Bakdim. So there was some excitement about about that, but personally, for me personally, I, I was looking more at thinking that Malaysia would have a good tournament. So guys, you know, as we get into the group stages and all that, you know, if you look, if you look at the groupings, you know, I would say Group A is definitely the group of death, lah, right? With Indonesia, Malaysia, and Thailand, and of course, you know, when somebody looked at on paper, Laos is going to have a hard time getting out of getting out of that group, lah, right? So, <laughs> but 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 you know, since since we'll be talking a lot about this Group A, you know, let's let's look at what actually happened on the other side of the draw, you know, in Group B. And uh, you know, Group B was something very interesting because I think Philippines turned out to be really the surprise of the of the tournament. You know, what 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 do you guys think about this Filipino team? Because uh, if you look at if you look at their results, you know, they they basically drew the first game with Singapore and then, uh, in fact, shock shocked the host Vietnam in the second game. So yeah. I mean, what 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 do you guys take make of this group? I mean, yeah, definitely unexpected. Definitely unexpected. Mm-hmm. And I think, uh, you know, if I'm not mistaken, the result against Vietnam is regarded in uh, Philippine football folklore as the miracle of Hanoi. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. uh, because uh, a, a few months back, uh, there was this uh, show organized by, I mean, there was this uh, live show organized by, you know, former star sport pundit Sashi Kumar from Singapore. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And one of, the, one of the guests actually, uh, Simon McNamee, who was the, the, Indo, the coach of the Indonesia team that Malaysia beat 3-2 in Jakarta la, la, last year. 
Mm. So uh, he was a coach of that Philippine that time. He, he was, was a Philippines young. coach, right? Yeah. Yeah, right. he was a very, relatively very young guy. I mean, very young. Mm. I think uh, probably twenties or something, if I'm not mistaken. Mm. So he was telling me about what actually happened. You know, the, the I mean, of course, if you're a Filipino, that was probably one of the most uh, uh, important nights in your footballing life, I would say. But yeah, uh, yeah. Kudos to Philippines. I mean, the, to me, Indeed. it was the beginning. It was the beginning of what the the team known as the Askal. I mean, I'm sure you know what's yeah. the Askal mean, right, Elwin? Yeah, yeah, correct. So Askal, so Askal means basically it's the street dog in <laughs> Philippines. You know those those mongrels that you see on the street and all that. So that's that that's what they are. And uh, and the thing is, it, this Filipino team also um, it gave us the first glimpse of Neil Etheridge. You know the we used to watch him in EPL. As a goalkeeper for Cardiff yeah. City and all that, yeah, and then yeah. you know him being a 20 year old in 20 year old in this tournament uh, was definitely some you know an, an, an interesting moment. And even just now you mentioned about the coach being young, we shouldn't forget about the young husbands. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. <laughs> yeah, so you know, the two the young husbands from the Philippines, so also also very. Interesting, yeah. interesting characters in that game. But I, but what do you think of Singapore? I think it was a disastrous performance. Yeah, yeah. it's disappointing. Yeah, I think I think Singapore made a mistake on the first game. I think they were leading one zero, and then mm. last minute the great reach equalized, and then it was basically deep in injury time. I think subsequently that was the downfall of Singapore, especially when the do or die game against Vietnam. Mm. So I think yeah, and then it was the Philippine team also was. Was full of this uh, great surprise because I think there are a lot of uh, players who looks like it doesn't look like Philippines like it's earlier told me like a young husband mm. all this kind yeah, of yeah, yeah. they kind of all chancy. mix mix yeah. parentage and a lot of them playing uh, overseas yep. and yeah yeah but I think that's give them the age I said maybe that's why I think the the policy paid off with Philippines as well and yeah it was, it was a great tournament for Philippines yep mm-hmm. yep. And I know, and of course, you know, and I hope maybe in future episode we can talk a little bit about Filipino football because how the young husbands were discovered was uh, an interesting story, uh, which is something I'll share with you guys after we finish that recording, this recording. So this is pretty much Group B as it is. So we, as we know, Vietnam finished on top, Filipino second, Singapore and Myanmar didn't make it out of the group. Yep. And with that said, guys, so let's. Get rolling into Malaysia's group because, as you know, you know the story of Malaysian football is just about to get even more interesting as we start, as we keep going further. But before we look into Malaysia's opening match against Indonesia, we would like to know what is it like the atmosphere inside the majestic Golora Bung Karno. We've heard so many, but I thought this would be a good time to bring in our next guest, Muhammad Fazri Haziz, who works for Astro Arena, who happens to be on the ground reporting from Jakarta. The atmosphere at Gelora Bung Karno in 2010 was electrifying, was magnificent for Indonesian fans, but for non-Indonesian fans, it's quite frightening actually. Uh, nak masuk stadium aja semua boleh katakan gelombang merah. Dan uh, although I myself could speak fluent Indonesian dialect due to my Indonesian heritage, but uh, they kind of know that I'm a Malaysian as well, but. All the all the medias were who were walking to the stadium uh, at that time. You were seeing at Athlete Century Park, and just walking distance to Kuala Bung Karno. But uh, the fans know that we are Malaysians, although some of us, most of us, could speak fluent Indonesian. But we were not harmed. Uh, right, uh, it's just that it's a bit frightening to see how passionate they were towards their country and all the uh, chance that uh, Ganyang Malaysia was widely heard uh, throughout the, the game, before the game, after the game uh, with uh, Indonesia and Gloria Bung Karno uh, that evening and also that night. Okay, and that, and that was a perspective of uh, someone reporting in the midst of this Gloria Bung Karno and the whole atmosphere there, guys. And, you know, for us, we were not there and all we can watch was from TV and my God, guys, I mean, what, 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 what do you guys think, think about getting into that stadium or actually feeling that atmosphere from your TV screen. I mean, I, I remember once, uh, I think Malaysia beat Indonesia 2-1. Mm-hmm. Liu Kipong, I think, what, what a spectacular header. What a, what a goal was that. And, you know, and of course, that, that time itself, you know, I, I'm thinking to myself, you know, that, 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 with that crowd there, wow. And then I remember in one Suzuki Cup final where Singapore beat them 3-0 in, and I was thinking to myself, are the Singapore fellas going to come out alive or what? <laughs> I, I mean, you know, the, the yeah. 
the atmosphere was so intense. It's so, I mean, it, it's something that I would say we you live for as a football in football. You you want to you you want to experience that kind of thing in, in your life. But I I guess for our football players, you know, it wasn't really things didn't start off start off on a on a, on a good note. I guess. I mean, uh, if you if you if you look at some of the fans they had that 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 pocho mask. mask and all that, you know, all this Pontiana mask. I mean, it's always been something with this Indonesia plus, right? Voila. I think, yeah, this is something like the Galatasre Stadium, like the Sami Yen. Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah Ali Sami Yen. I think, it's, like what Sivan said, like, you know, it's uh, good to be a football fan and be the fan rather than be the away fan. So, <laughs> and then, yeah, what, what the advice was it? Mm. Mm-hmm. And, 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 if we get, and if we get deeper into the game, you know, uh, I think Malaysia having that young squad had a dream start, lah, guys. You know, yeah. uh, what is this? Uh, Shafi was uh, Shafi was very unselfish, setting up Matyo for the goal. Oh, here comes Malaysia. It's opened up for them. It's a great chance. National gives Malaysia a one-goal lead, and it came from absolutely nothing. But yeah. but then I think that just awoken the Indonesia guys, lah. After that, my goodness, what I. I mean, what happened after that? Man? Well, you know, of, of course, uh, first we considered an own goal, mm. twenty second minute, and then uh, within half time we were already trailing two one. I think this guy called uh, Gonzalez scored the second goal, and then yeah. a few and more, couple of mistakes cost us uh, three more further goals, including one mm-hmm. further in injury time, by the way. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But somehow or other, I think you know the score line didn't necessarily. Um, I don't think it's a reflection of what really happened on the field because I think our boys did. I think they were they were playing. I think they had they had an idea. They were trying to execute the idea. Like I don't know, maybe the circumstances at that time was overwhelming on them. Yeah, Bala, do you think it's inexperience of the young squad facing this challenge uh, in the stadium? No, I think basically the environment there because away away game and then I think this is the first international tournament they're playing. Mm-hmm. On top of, of this kind of expectation with 60,000 crowds, yeah. hostile crowds, and also I think the Indonesian team was strong. And also, uh, Christian Gonzalez was actually is a Uruguayan, mm-hmm. and he was the first uh, Indonesia naturalized player. Mm-hmm. And uh, he did play with Rekoba in uh, under 20 World Cup. So, mm-hmm. so that he basically had a history, and uh, and I think everything clicked well. And Indonesia were Indonesia that day, and mm-hmm. I think that was why it was smashed. Maybe they were more clinical compared to Malaysia on the uh, attacking side. I mean, we did give away, we did give away quite a lot of easy goals, lah. If you look yeah, at it, yeah. quite, I mean, I would say like schoolboy mistakes. I mean, maybe in the moment of panic, like, especially in our central defense, our two center backs, the partnership. Uh, I mean, they had a, basically a day to forget, lah. Yeah, to but also, well. but also, I think this is common. I think because you see, like uh, even Spain, you know, when this when they started the World Cup in uh, two thousand ten. Yeah, they were smashed by Holland forward 5 1 as well. Yeah, so, 12, 14, 14, yep. Uh, so I think it's maybe just a beginner's, uh, I don't know, trauma, whatever is it. But I think after that, only they usually they build up the team forward to the future. Mm-hmm. And and of course, I, I remember the, the reaction among the, the press, reading the newspaper and all that. It was yes. basically, yes. Ba- basically uh, you know, uh, what, what's, what's that thing? You know, that, that basically the whole media was basically being an executioner. They pretty much read the verdict of this Malaysian team. You know, this is it. You're done. You know, so not... all, the, all the knives were out. Uh, and the knives were out. all the target it, it, behind their back. Yeah, it's, all, it's almost like they already written off anything that from this, this Malaysian team. To, to but, then, the... but then, to be frank, what do you expect from media, guys? You know, they score 5-1. First game. Well, it's not, nothing positive for the game. Despite you can say all, I think, by the end of the day, the scoreline matter. So, yeah. I, think, I, think, I think even media... Cannot find any any reason to celebrate or even at least to say a word good or two, like you know. I mean, I, I, I mean, losing five one is already bad enough. This is the derby, Musanta. Uh-huh. Like, so yeah. and to actually, to El, actually El lose, yeah, to actually yes. lose to to Indonesia this bad is something you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, really, good luck to them. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, I mean, I mean, so you can imagine the amount of pressure Coach Raja had to yeah. you know absorb mm-hmm. after this game. But then, yeah. good thing happened also. I think is maybe blessing this guy because maybe he found the weakness in his team. And it's good that it came early. Yes, yes good point. So maybe yeah. 
if only maybe happened this in semi final or final the first leg i think things would have been much worse yeah yeah I'm yeah, sure. it, yeah it'd be much difficult to make change at that stage because you already had a team that delivered you all the while yeah it won't be easy for you to make a change at that stage but this is happening in your first game so yes, you know correct. you know there's still time on your side to do something so you can make those very drastic decisions and i think one of the most important decision that he made which we were focus on the game against thailand but speaking of thailand i think There was some good news for us because they somehow rather surprisingly they drew two all with Laos. In I, fact, it, yeah, that, I, I mean you would you we would expect Thailand to walk over that game, but you know they actually drew. In fact, they they scored a last it was in the, in the last minute last goal. minute goal. Can, can can I put it Danieli Laos to Laos? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> And, <laughs> Yeah. So yeah. perhaps, perhaps maybe as we go further, we might look back at this result as a blessing in disguise in yeah. some way. But first, you know, we got our we got someone from Indonesia, Anthony Sutton. We want to ask him about what was the reaction, in, you know, among the Indonesian public or generally Indonesia following this five-one win. Well, I think like anywhere in Southeast Asia, once you win, once you win a game five-one, that's it. You, you know, you're you're guaranteed winning the next World Cup. Um, <laughs> People just went over the top and saying, "You know, we're on our way here. We're going to do it. Um, this is ours to win." Um, I can't remember. I don't remember too much about the game now, but that, I think that was the reaction really around the country, and um, it really helped catapult Indonesian football into. Um, I think I, I wrote about it. It's been like it's the Premier League moment in England, or 1996 Euro '96 in England when. Um, people's perceptions of football in Indonesia changed. And you suddenly had people who weren't in, previously, you say to them, oh, Indonesia football. And they're like, ah, hooligans, fighting, corruption, match fixing, blah, blah, blah. And now suddenly, you had like middle-class people from three backgrounds taking an interest in the games. And um, in the games after the Malaysia game, you see people going to, you see like celebrities going to games who would never normally go to games. And they'll turn up with their camera crew in tow and, Made their little vlogs about look at me, look at me, and watching football match in Indonesia type thing. So it was a game that very much changed perception. It made the country feel really, really good. Yeah, I think the fact that they beat Malaysia right. itself, that's yeah. so convincing as well, did a lot to um, boost morale within the country about football. Um, and people were generally excited to see Gonzalez, to see Erfan back then, and also they, they uh, a new player come on, Otto Otomaniani, who ran around a lot and he had people getting excited. So it was very much um, a watershed in Indonesian football, I think, that particular game and that result. And the fact that it came against Malaysia um, made things even better for them, for the, for the supporters. That's a great ball whipped into the far post and he's got his goal and no one deserves it more than him. His first international goal for Indonesia. Irfan Bakhtim came sliding in at the far post. Sparks up a cigar to the fans and also... So, basically, you know, that was what happened in the first game against uh, Indonesia. And, of course, next thing we move up against uh, Thailand. Not an ideal circumstances for us, considering that after losing that game and now playing against another team like Thailand, obviously it was, uh, I don't know, a very tough situation uh, for Coach Raja Gopal to figure out what's best for this team. But I guess, you know, he, he stick to pretty much most of the players, except for one very important, crucial decision, guys, which is the goalkeeper. He decided yeah. that it was time for, for Cairo, uh, Cairo Fami to finally make his mark as a senior goalkeeper in his national team. I think, well, I think that was, uh, I, don't know, I don't know how to put it in, in, in the magical words. You know, when you make that decision and it, everything seems to click, turns out right. Yeah. yeah. And the most important thing is the scoreline was zero. So basically, the decision was right, and then uh, it basically became the wall. And then was even though Thailand was the pounding in this plus, so he, he not only made the right decision, but also I think he secured one of the moral uh, boosting uh, situation whereby for mauling five one to getting draw with this Thailand team, isn't it, Elvin? Yeah, correct. Because you you imagine, uh, yeah, losing your first game five one against Indonesia. See, Malaysia, they had to make a good start because. You know, like it or not, they're only getting Laos in the last game. So, so, so they cannot screw up these first two games, right? And the first one, the first one already screwed, right? And and like earlier we mentioned, we were lucky that you know Laos, Laos did did help us in a bit in that part. But you know, this was definitely, uh, I would say, a damage limitation exercise because Malaysia kind of sat back in this game and Thailand players were actually kind of attacking a lot. 
Yeah. But, uh, you know, we already thank uh, Coach Raja for making the change. Uh, you know, Ape for being a good goalkeeper, of course. And we also need to thank another guy, and he's from Thailand. His name is Sarayut uh, Chaikamadi for his woeful finishing. <laughs> and uh, in, in a way, in a way that, was, that, was, that actually helped the Malaysian team as well. Although, yeah. if you look at it, uh, Kunalan did have a chance that he blasted over the bar. I mean, imagine if he'd taken that chance, maybe the, the, it would be a different story. But, you know, all I think all that matters was the clean sheet. Like what you say, it's for, it's for goalkeeper. And what, I, think, I mean, imagine what is Brian Robson thinking? I, mean, I, <laughs> I think Chaka Mendy, uh, what, uh, I think he forgot his boots. Whereby our family had a golden glove at the time, I think. Yeah, yeah. Cairo yeah. Fani. Cairo Fani with a golden yes. glove performance. I mean, of course, again, it comes back to what we talked earlier, trust. You know, in such a very mm-hmm. hard circumstances when you are having your backs against the wall. Because I think, as you know, the, the, the critics were already out there after the first game. And everybody thought Thailand is just going to put the sword. Basically, they're going to put a sword, you know, in, in, into the Malaysian heart and put, put, put us out of our misery. But the teams, you know, responded to the coach. They did what they're supposed to do. And they, they, of course, it wasn't a win, but they still managed to get a point. It was a hard tooth nail fought win. I mean, sorry, draw. And with that one point, of course, you know, basically we, was, we still got a lifeline going into the last game. But uh, I don't know, guys, you know, what, what, what can we expect more after this? It's something really interesting to look forward to. Yeah, I think uh, because you also understand the Laos when they draw with uh, Thailand. So it could be a potential of uh, banana skin uh, issues and then we never know Laos' strength because it's not easy to beat them as well. So mm-hmm. I think the last game was also a mystery and, and whereby Indonesia has qualified for the next round. Mm-hmm. And, so and, was, and, you, and you must understand also that uh, Indonesia did hammer Laos 6 nil also in that. So, so I think in a way... You see, these Laos plus these Laos guys probably you know one in one part they gave us hope that okay they can they can draw with Thailand plus another part okay it's uh, I mean we know disrespect to Laos but you know then when 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 Indonesia did did hammer them six nil so it did give us that, that hope that okay you know this this either the weather the Laos plus have used up all their energy for the first game and then they got tired for the next two games I'm not sure but yeah. But, so then how, win. but then Elvin, mm. don't forget, because after, after the second game, Indonesia was having six points. Yeah. Thailand, two, and Malaysia and Laos at 1-1. One, one. So, Correct. Even Laos had a chance to qualify. You know? Yes, yes, so, exactly. So, so, the question now is, which Laos is going to turn up against Malaysia? Yes. yes. Is yes. it the Laos against Thailand or the Laos against Indonesia? So, yes. that's something that we will, we will talk about as we get further into this, uh, into this episode. But first, uh, again, we want to know from one of our guests exactly, you know, whether they were surprised to the result against Thailand, considering how the team had to pick themselves up following the Indonesia game. Able to get the ball away in time, and there it is, the full-time whistle. Let's remind you once again, it was Thailand playing Malaysia at the Gelora Bunkarno Stadium in Jakarta. Thailand nil, Malaysia nil. A question for Carl. What was your feeling going into the last game against Laos, knowing Malaysia still had to depend on the result between Indonesia and Thailand. Did you have any concern if Indonesia might just take their foot off the pedal? Hmm, okay. So, in regards to that, I, I, I don't think so because like they're in home. They're in home. They're playing at uh, Gelora Burkano, if I'm mistaken. And they have to please the fan, you know, like uh, realistically speaking, a fan paying uh, X amount of uh, uh, money to watch, uh, to watch the team lose so that their rivals to get knocked out, you know, as a fan, it would be disappointing. Lah. So, I don't think so. That was uh, a part of their thinking. Uh, you know, hey, let's, let's, let's intentionally lose so that Malaysia can be not, knocked out. No, I think it's more of like they're near their home, home soil. Uh, they, they want to appease their fans that, you know, we, ha- we are building momentum towards the next round and eventually winning the whole thing. Uh, and... I don't think so. That was the part that was, that was, that was in the mind. Uh, good. Okay, and that was Carl's take on uh, what, what are Malaysia's, Malaysia's chances getting, in, getting into this final game against Laos. But, you know, as, as this game uh, progressed, I think, uh, Steven, to answer your question, which Laos showed up, I think it was the most, I mean, the Laos, Laos against Indonesia, the second, the second version of Laos. You know, 
And uh, you know, up to this point, Malaysia already scored um, you know five goals against Laos. Safi Sali has yet to score. Yep. That's that. That was something interesting. And Amri Raya, and Amri Yaya really showed up for this game, guys. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, again, you know, our Malaysian boys didn't make it easier for us as well. They scored first, and then Laos equalized. So it yes. was like you know, I think for all of us back home watching this game, we were like probably chew, chewing, chewing our fingernails. You know, yeah, <laughs> thinking like, what's, what's going to happen? Correct. Yeah. 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 I yeah. mean. But 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 I mean we were hopeful because we went into the second half and even almost deep into second uh, second half with a two one lead, where else there was nothing going on in between Indonesia and Thailand. So I I don't know guys you know, what what would you be thinking at this stage? I mean what what will go through your mind at this current stage? I mean do you think that like okay we're almost there or do you think that you know you're still having this bit of nervous, you know? Because to be frank, though this game when Malaysia entered, I mean third game, all all indication for was for what do you call that for Thailand because Indonesia already qualified top of the group. We say we met the we met the requirement. Mm-hmm. Second, they are facing uh, Thailand, mm-hmm. which desperately need to win. And then yes, on on top of that, they need to beat Thailand in order Malaysia to qualify as uh, runners up. Mm-hmm. So uh, at that moment, our time looks like. I think if I were we were watching that time, we think a bit like gloomy. In fact, after Laos to bleed, and this first yeah, taking lead. Okay, you know you know why sometimes I I I I I'm maybe a little bit pessimistic about this situation because if I remember in France '98, mm-hmm. it happened in two groups. Remember, you know the Scotland Morocco game. Moroccan players are celebrating, and then yeah. it happened in Norway Brazil. And I also yeah. remember similar thing when Spain whack. Uh, Well, I think they were like Bulgaria or something. Mm-hmm. Whereas the other game, Nigeria was pretty much losing to Paraguay. So mm-hmm. that sort of deja vu is coming back to me, thinking, you know, I'm, I mean, are we really going to depend on Indonesia to do the job for us? At least do 50% of the job for us? Because mm-hmm. we, already, we are already doing our part, our 50% here, right? Yeah, so basically it was not fully in our hands, lah, right? So so we, we we had to rely, we had to rely on our Nusantara brothers to really help us out, <laughs> help us out in this case, you know. And uh, and and you know, and and how did it feel when suddenly Thailand took the lead, guys? Well, for that I I don't know. Let's let's just uh, ask Carl on this because since you know we did ask him about this question, what's going through his head when the moment Thailand took the lead? Of course, you know we also have a lot to say. We'll be right back. South Africa. Well, I wouldn't say embarrassing. South Africa are a good side. That's a goal! My word! He's floated that in well past the goalkeeper, Marcus Harrison. And it's Natapong Samana. It looked like, yes it is, or Suri Suka rather, who's got the goal. Well, that was something out of nothing. Of course, uh, when Thailand took the lead, and uh, was a bit deflating. But again, uh, we just focus on on the game that you know. Uh, we just focus on the Malaysia's game, lah. And whatever happens, happens, lah. And then uh, the following day, when we, you know, obviously when full time happened, we know what happened. Up is more to uh, just a very quick funny story. Uh, a friend of mine who is a Slango supporter, he was like, "Oh, he's so happy because like Bambang uh, was the one that scored the two goals." So he was like, "We should really give uh, <laughs> uh, some flowers back to Bambang and push him So uh, you know, in a sense, uh, Slango played play a contribution for for that lah. <laughs> mm, yeah, 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 yeah. It makes a lot of sense, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but 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 you know, like like overall, were, were you like you know, did you did you have any fingernails still left after the the this match? Uh, I think you know, as as a Malaysian fan, yeah. you know, growing up, you know, whatever happens happens lah. You know, you <laughs> you know, you have that yeah. case sera sera lah lah. So much um, which 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 is very true. You know, I mean, um, we we all kind of got kind of used to that kind of you mm. know, feeling already. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, like we we had low low points before. You know, like uh, you know, of course, obviously, it was it it would be disappointing to be good to get knocked out after getting a uh, Sea Games medal. The Previous year, yeah, you know, yeah. you 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 feel that the momentum is building and building and building with the with the team, mm-hmm. but you know, uh, but again, just 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 focusing on the Malaysian team playing against Laos that night, they have done a very good job, you know, coming up from a five one defeat, then drew against uh, Thailand zero zero the following game, then winning against Laos five one. Yes, obviously there were a lot of tensions uh, amongst all of us. Then when Bambang slotted the go the penalties, um, mm. you know, of course lah, you know, uh, 
you know, looking hindsight is 2020 lah. Maybe there was like uh, a hikmah lah. Uh, apa, that, uh, that it happened, you know. And obviously, eventually, we win the whole thing. Uh, uh, through on hindsight lah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Now Malaysia pushing forward, yeah, a bit of space, a great ball, that should be the second goal. Okay, so that was Carl basically, you know, giving us his view when the moment Thailand took the lead. And I don't know, for me, with eight minutes left, I thought, you know, if anything is going to happen, if we need a miracle, it has to happen now. Yep. And, wow. I think Elwin, I mean, you know, like what Carl said, you know, thank God for a former Selangor guy yes. to really help us when we really needed the most. Bang, bang, man. <laughs> and, it, and it came and bang, bang, bang really came big this time for us, man. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Just yeah, when yeah. we needed, needed him the most, he mm-hmm. came. and But of course, a draw was pretty much good enough. And But, you know, still, if anything can happen in that last... Yeah, because Thailand, Thailand was still pressing on for the win. Because Thailand, you know, even after Indonesia equalized, if mm-hmm. they get another goal, they'll still go through. So, so you know, it was that really tense, tense moments there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but, but also I feel that I think uh, Indonesia also I think went the game with the mindset to win. Mm-hmm. Reason being, I think uh, I think nobody took lead against them beside Malaysia, uh, beside uh, uh, Thailand first. So I think the squad was there. Maybe they just about to come to hit the right moment. So I think rather than giving chance to Malaysia to qualify and then and then have a better opportunity, I think what they did was they better they killed Thailand in the group stage now. So, so, so facing them along the way. So I think it's one of the uh, what to say. I think one of the good strategy they did to 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 avoid uh, Thailand maybe in the future of knockout rounds because I think after that they met Vietnam, which I think. For the 50-50 game. So, I think it was actually a very good decision. So, you felt that, you know, I mean, because, okay, for me, it's like this, you know, when I think of us in Indonesia, it's, it's rivalry. Mm-hmm. And I'm thinking like, you know, Indonesia could have just, you know, decided to put us out of us for good rather than, sure. I mean, because I remember, I think in 2002, Syria, where Lazio fans were booing their own team yeah. for beating Inter Milan because they didn't want Roma to Roma, beat, yeah. Yeah. take the Scudetto. <laughs> You know, so, I, I, so I look back at this situation, it's like, you know, I mean, why why wouldn't the I mean there must have been pressure on Indonesia to not to, you know, take it easy on this game. But you know, somehow or other, again, you know, Slango, I mean, Bepe, Bambang, thank you so much. You know, thank you for your two goals. Can he do it again? Bambang Pamunkas. Yes, he can. And it's game set and match now, surely. For Thailand, they cannot come back from this now, you feel. And Indonesia, who have barely turned up in this game, have suddenly turned things round in the last 10 minutes or so and scored two penalties. But Elwin, I mean, which, I mean, would you agree from Bala's aspect or would you thought that, you know, that rivalry and all that, I mean... What is your take on this? Okay, so so I mean, Bala's aspect here is saying kill off your your strongest opponent as early as you can because if you look back at it, Indonesia Indonesia looked at Thailand as a bigger threat than Malaysia, and I think maybe they also overestimated Malaysia. You know, I mean, uh, after whacking them five one, but if you think think about it, why not Indonesia go all out and win all their three games? You know, like keep the momentum going. Use because up to up to that up to that point. They already banged in 11 goals from mm-hmm. two games, right? Mm-hmm. So they wanted to keep the momentum going because sometimes you don't want these kind of disruptions happening in the in the how how would I put it in that process? You see, because if you remember, there there, there were many times also World Cup teams, you know, they win the first two games and then the third game they go and rest, they go and rest and they put a totally like a second squad of players and all these just to complete the fixtures. And then next thing, it's like they, they have this rust in them and the whole momentum is disrupted and next thing, the second round, they are out. I mean, we have seen this happen. They've mm-hmm. seen this thing happen many times. So, Indonesia, I think to me here, yeah, they just wanted to keep the momentum going regardless whether it's, uh, you know, whether it's Malaysia or Thailand and all this. We want to win. We want to come out with maximum points. We want to show that, I mean, for them, they really, they really wanted to win this tournament so badly and you can really see it in all their performances. Yeah. yeah, but then Elvin, looking at the other angle as well, you see, mm. 
after they already qualified the last two games, mm. I think they should at least rest the team to mm. prepare the next round. Maybe because they are, they might think in my my face that moment that maybe Singapore or even Philippines. Mm-hmm. So I think they should should have rested the team is uh, strategy so by they prepare for the quarter semi final and the final onwards. But looking at this team, they put a strong team. Yes. Very strong team, and then went all out, and yes. then they neck to neck with Tyler, who desperate for a win. Yes. So I think it's rather than uh, rather than uh, like professionalism, I think there was a lot of psychological behind behind their victory was to basically to to just to eliminate Thailand from early round because mm-hmm. I think after them was Vietnam. I think Malaysia wasn't even I would say favorite after after that whatever happened. So the interesting But- point was the. Uh, The way they came in, the way they bombarded Thailand, and the squad they chose was not even a B team was there. Actually. Yeah, but 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 you look at it, ah, Bala. You see, you're Indonesia, right? You're going into that final game, right? Yeah. You got six points already. Yeah. But but have a look at that stadium, right? It is still full capacity. Yeah, <laughs> so the yeah. game, the, you know, the yes, I mean, nice. dude, the, the 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 players, you know, you 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 don't yeah, want yeah, to, you don't really, to, yes, you pressure, don't yeah. want to leave, you don't want to leave the stadium, you know. Getting whacked by Thailand or something like that because the fans, the Indonesia fans, come from a different. Uh, I mean, a lot of them come from very poor economic background and all this, and they are spending their hard-earned money to fill up that stand. And, and yeah. the, so the players definitely needed to show up that day, regardless of what. So I think, as an Indonesian player, I think you you basically go in the game to win everything, you yeah. know. And yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. but yeah. football, like what I say, like you know, is uh, something is you cannot predict. So I think whatever risk you're taking only towards the final, you know what's the what the right thing. But I think in this case, Indonesia might I feel might made some mistake because of the uh, because we realized after the game the uh, following game they played in the after a week a week later they played in the uh, semi final. Mm-hmm. So the player would have much rested and a better equipped with fresh mentality as well because playing a sixty five thousand crowd is not a easy task as well, you see. Mm-hmm. So maybe I think yeah, history did say something. But interesting times and uh, thank you to our Musantara Bros. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. And, <laughs> thanks Garuda. Yeah. And, and, and 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 interesting another interesting point since you guys are Slango fans, you know, uh, I think four out of five goals scored by Malaysia on that night. Of course, Amriya scored twice mm-hmm. and then Amirul. Mm-hmm. Okay, I think basically uh, three or four other goals were actually scored by Slango players who were playing for Slango at that time. Mm-hmm. So you know, to to be frank, I think Slango had a huge role to play on that day because that also coming from a former Slango player, Bambang scoring twice against Thailand, yeah. really really helped. Uh, pretty much gave Malaysia another lifeline, uh, basically for us going into the semi-final, which of course we will face uh, Vietnam. But as as you all know, that's another entire story altogether. There's still more to come because we are just about to get started. This is where perhaps things are starting to get more interesting because for me personally, I think that our boys are picking at the right time. I think they're starting to get, you know, that momentum. You, you started to feel like, you know, like that 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 uh, locomotive engine, you know, slowly yeah. it's spinning and it's going around, around, around. Yeah, and yes. now, now it's like... It's moving it's, already. It's like a freight train, the inner shah, you know, you can't stop it really. But before that, let's bring in our guest, Fadzri Hasis again, as we would like to know from his perspective on what was the expectation of this Harimau Malaya team prior to start of the tournament and how surprised he was by the outcome so far. Indonesia has uh, almost certainly helped them. And that is the final score line. Here uh, at the Palembang Jakabaring Stadium. 5-1 the scoreline. Well, there you go. Jubilation scenes. They just found out the scoreline between uh, Thailand and Indonesia as Malaysia will go through to the semi-finals of the AFF Suzuki Cup. Frankly, I felt the expectation was not that high because few key players were injured before the AFF 2010, namely uh, ideals of one and also Zakonadha, the twins and uh, and also experienced defender on Hafiz Zamani Misbah however the inclusion of uh, Savi Sadi uh, probably changed all that once the tournament gets started uh, of course the team did not start well with the 5-1 beating 
in the hands of uh, the host Indonesia but uh, dalam game dalam Thailand I personally felt that there were probably a chance because there were rumors at time that few of the, the senior Thai players were not happy playing under Brian Robson at that time so we got a result nil nil and after that it was an open game and we managed to get uh, I mean an open chance for us to get to the semi-finals and after that we managed to get a win against Laos we also Indonesia doing us a favour against Thailand and against the rest of the season we have uh, strong determination and uh, throughout the tournament Safiq Rahim stood out as the captain as well besides uh, Safi getting the goals and the defence led by Muslim Muhammad and uh, Fadli Shahs were considered, uh, consistent towards the tournament after the the first heavy defeat uh, the first game heavy defeat to Indonesia he gained more uh, confidence game after game and there you have it everyone it's the this brings us to the end of the first part of this AFF Suzuki Cup tribute and stay tuned for the second part where we dive deeper into this tournament.